Kia ora, I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. Today on The Detail, ever wondered what it's like to be inside an icebreaker making its way to one of the remotest parts of the earth? Well, just listen to this. You'd be reasonably peaceful in your bunk or on one of the lounges and then just boom. It would be like the worst aircraft turbulence coupled with the loudest thunderstorm. It's astounding. This is Craig Stevens, voyage leader on board the Italian icebreaker Laura Bassi as it sailed deep into Antarctica's Ross Sea, ironically deeper than can usually be reached because of the melting sea ice that they're investigating. So that's from inside the tin can as it were, but then you, if you go out on the sides of the deck where you could observe... just these massive chunks of ice rearing up as, as the ship carves through it. But, you, you know, ever the scientist, you get to, um, A, sort of think about how all these ice flows interact, but also when the ice, um, sea ice flips over, it'll have sort of brownie green goop. Hmm. Um, that's, a, that's a physical term from a physicist, <laughs> um, but, it's, but it's actually the basis of the food chain, right? It's, it's, you'd make the connection that that's why there were heaps of penguins around and that's why there were heaps of seals and whales. That's a snippet of life on board the Laura Bassi, a joint New Zealand-Italian expedition, the first of its kind. It's just returned the Kiwis and its crew to Littleton after two months away. Their mission? to discover more about Polinias, the so-called sea ice factories of Antarctica. When we were there in Antarctica, we actually had a Polinia event. Uh, but to actually be in there and experience like just the, how big it is and how much force nature has during these events, that was very great to experience. Today, we find out what this expedition will tell us about climate change by studying the Polinias and what the collapse of the sea ice last year has to do with it. Craig Stevens is Niwa's principal scientist who helped pull it together in a very big hurry. Polinias, they're a remarkable feature. You, you get them around Antarctica, you get them in some parts of the Arctic, mostly. Uh, it's where really strong wind, cold wind, blows away any sea ice and makes a clear sort of patch of ocean, but that exposes the ocean to, to more wind and really cold temperatures. So it's a, it's a sea ice factory, so it creates new ice, um, but at the same time when that ice gets made, it forces the salt in the seawater out into the ocean and makes for salty water. And when you have salty water at the surface of the ocean, it, it tends to want to sink. And so... Um, Polinia are remarkable in that they're quite geographically small. They might be a few hundred kilometres in scale, but their impacts get felt throughout all of the uh, oceans on the planet. So this, this cold, salty water drains to the seabed and then sort of works its way north and, and cycles throughout the, the entire oceans over about a thousand years. It's, it's not so common for us to actually be there when the ocean is actually operating as a polinia. That tends to happen later in the year when you get towards winter. And so we're, we're mainly uh, about leaving instruments behind, installed at the same location, but also robots that drift around. We're in there for the long haul, as it were. So that's the sort of the big picture for hitting up a polinia for some understanding about how they're working. Now, I've got a really great description of this expedition that this voyage is the first of its kind and it happened very fast after Antarctic sea ice dropped off the cliff last year. Well, aspects of that are true. Um, <laughs> certainly the, the sea ice, it was, it was a real, I don't necessarily want to say shock because uh, to, to my mind, the actual shock was that the, the changes that we saw last year hadn't happened earlier. According to the National Snow and Ice Data Center, Antarctica's sea ice is now at its lowest point since satellites started monitoring the levels in 1979. Scientists thought it was somewhat immune to the effects uh, because the ice around the continent was growing. In 2014, it was about 7 million square miles. But in less than 10 years, the National Snow and Ice Center out of Colorado has confirmed 
It has broken the record again now. It is just over 700,000 square miles. As sea ice freezes in winter and melts in summer, it pumps vital nutrients into the ocean. It's like a heartbeat for the ocean. But what we've seen lately is a, is a marked change in that cycle. And the loss of sea ice could see the global ocean warm even more rapidly. Really, the only thing we can do is reduce our fossil fuel usage and greenhouse gas emissions. Antarctic scientists were looking at this sort of reasonably stable sea ice over the past sort of decade or two, and it was one of the conundrums for us that, that it wasn't particularly changing in terms of its area. And, and part of that lies with um, satellites, uh, which we primarily use to give us our sea ice area index. They can't measure how thick the sea ice is. So you could have some sea ice that was really quite thin, and it would register the same sort of signals as some some much thicker sea ice and obvi obviously thicker sea ice is more resilient to a warming ocean so we had this dramatic change with this dramatic drop in sea ice last year the the voyage um what was new about the voyage was new zealand's participation in it um, but the italians this was their 39th expedition to antarctica they they call it and so it sort of all came to fruition with lots of talking um, and a bit of a rush um, mid last year when we worked out there was an opportunity to uh, combine with this Italian voyage and have a, a dedicated New Zealand component. Why is it so important to have that New Zealand component? As in, what does it mean for New Zealand and New Zealanders? So, so Antarctic science is very international. So at the base level, it's... New Zealand contributing some of the team that's working on the globally relevant processes around Antarctica and we get to, we share a lot of data, et cetera, et cetera. But where it comes back to then benefit New Zealand is, you know, the, the big question for, for everyone is how do these dramatic changes at the poles manifest themselves in different parts of the, the planet? And so you need those people working on the sort of the high latitude, the Antarctic questions uh, to look at how that will then follow through to having impacts for New Zealand in terms of sort of changed ocean currents or changed levels of oxygen. But they'll also be um, short term in changes of ecosystems and how that will influence fisheries, but also sea ice and the connections to, to weather cycles and, and how much um, sort of impact we'll see from Antarctica on our weather around New Zealand. This ship that you went on, you sailed into the heart of the Ross Sea Polynia. Is that right? You know, the, the heart analogy is a great one. I'm just working on that for a, a talk at the moment in that the heart has chambers, right? So this, this one thing is vital for, for pumping oxygenated blood around our bodies. In the same way, um, the Ross Sea has chambers. And so Polynia are really important in one of the chambers. And then in the other chambers, you've got them beneath the ice shelf. So the, the Ross ice shelf is the largest on the planet. And, and we've got a long history of working in those chambers. Um, and then there's a, another chamber, and this is where the um, Laura Bassi came in. Being an icebreaker, it was able to get us with you know a strong margin of safety over into the Eastern Ross Sea, um, and so that's the chamber that we're looking at to see where warmer water and more meltwater from the, the parts of Antarctica that are really melting, um, how that's coming in to this sort of integrated four chamber system. So, so having that sort of um, heart analogy is, is a really good one. So what makes this one different? I mean, is it the fact that you are getting in there to the heart of it? A hundred percent, you know. And icebreaker infrastructure is the kind of thing that it, uh, they're very expensive vessels to maintain and they're, they're not particularly good for much else, right? Uh, and so getting access to that and being able to take our instruments and our robots to parts of the Ross Sea that we just, you just can't normally access, that was where the, the real newness for us came in. But I would add to that, uh, in terms of, of how science works, there's nothing more um, 
collaborative than than sitting in a tin can with with colleagues for a couple of months and you know either things break down and, and you start fighting or you get on and and really um, learn some things about the science from from discussions um, with these these great people working on the similar parts of the story. The video that goes with the sound from the ship shows the Italian and Kiwi crews in their orange overalls wearing thick gloves and yellow helmets huddled over their equipment. For one young scientist on board, it brings to life the satellite images she's been studying on her laptop back in Wellington. I'm Liv Connellison and I am a PhD student uh, based at NIWA in Wellington and affiliated with uh, the Auckland University. And my research is on mooring observations in Terra Nova Bay, which is a bay in the Ross Sea in Antarctica, and also in ocean modelling. What was it like for you? Is, this was your first expedition to Antarctica? Um, yes, yeah, so this is my first expedition to Antarctica, but also only my second ever long trip at sea. So it, part of it, you know, was just actually getting there and being in the area. Um, so what I, you know, the Polini events, you can see them from space. So I've been looking at uh, satellite data and actually looking at, you know, the open ocean from my computer screen, you know, during my first year in my PhD. And then when we were there in Antarctica, we actually had a Polinia event in Terra Nova Bay. Um, so we could, you know, it was super rough, like we had uh, high swell, high winds, it was freezing cold. I was very seasick during that day, uh, but to actually be in there and experience like just uh, how big it is and how much force nature has during these events. That was, you know, very great to experience. Something that you wouldn't learn from just sitting at your laptop. Looking at the satellite image of it. Yeah. What, what, what actually is a Polinia event? So a Polinia event is when the ocean is opened and you've got sea ice surrounding. And to open a Polinia, you need very high winds, and these are called catabatic. And a catabatic wind is when wind basically drops with gravity down an ice shelf. It generates a lot of velocity, so there are very strong, high-velocity winds. And that's when it those winds push the sea ice away. And those winds are not always there. You know, it's just as we have here um, in New Zealand or on land, sometimes it's very windy, sometimes it's very calm. And so you need those high winds to open up the Polinia. Well, I was reading that the Polinia in the Ross Sea is the largest in Antarctica. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, so we sailed as part of our voyage along the Ross Ice Shelf. And that took us three or four days to sail across the Ross Ice Shelf, and that's just the base of, of the Polinia. You, you always hear that, you know, Antarctica stores a lot of ice and there for a lot of fresh water. And, you know, if it melts, we get so much sea ice. And it's, you know, hard to imagine that. But when you're actually there and you just see the ice in just, you know, the small regions that we, we got to with the ship, it it's a massive amount there. Craig Stevens is a veteran of ocean expeditions around Aotearoa and he's flown into Antarctica for ice camps. But this trip on Laura Bassey was something else. And not just for the overlapping conversations between the Italians and New Zealanders inside what Craig likes to call a tin can, or the dramas of carving through the ice in a storm. Certainly there's nothing like it in terms of vessel experiences. You know, we had researchers on board that were targeted with, with measuring that biological sort of chain from, from basically the microscopic stuff uh, through up until the, the big things like penguins and whales. And so that's the biological side that you'd look at this trail of, of broken sea ice, but there'd also occasionally be um, lots of ice crystals. These would be forming on the underside of the ice because the seawater is so cold 
that it actually wants to freeze of its own volition, as it were. And, and you get this when you're looking at uh, ocean water that's been affected by um, these big ice shelves. And so this, this connects across to lots of our other research. And so with the warming ocean, we're, we're changing all these you know, key components of how our planet works. And, and that's what we're down there trying to do is to, is to tie down the, the bits of the jigsaw puzzle so that we can come back with a bit more knowledge around the pieces. I mean, there is so much urgency to this, isn't there, about getting that message out because this is such a barometer, I suppose, of what is going on in the world climate-wise? Yes. Science can move slowly um, most of the time. You know, it takes you a, a few years to decide on a problem, to write a proposal, a few years to, to do the work, and a few years to publish it. We just don't have that time anymore in terms of identifying the changes and communicating the seriousness of that to to all audiences, you know, stretch, stretching from school kids to, to policy designers and, and everyone in between. You know, literally, we're looking at a changed planet if we can't pull down the sort of emissions that are, that are happening at the moment and of the recent decades. From that expedition, uh, you know, what were the things that surprised you most about it? I mean, you must have gone with sort of some expectations. Yeah. Um, some of the robots that we took are ocean gliders, these are neat little devices. They're maybe a metre and a half long, uh, and they're sort of a, a yellow tube with some little wings. And they're very clever. They'll, they'll go on missions for a few days through to a month or two, and they'll collect sort of temperature and oxygen uh, data throughout the water from the surface to the seabed. And the, the neat thing about them is that you don't need to have the ship close by, so you can drop them off to do their thing. They're, they're a drone, essentially. And so we had a plan for how we were going to deploy three of these. We had two Italian ocean gliders and one from New Zealand, from Niwa. And we got the two Italian ones in. And then by the time we got to the New Zealand one, the weather had turned on us a little bit and we weren't happy with the conditions. And so we had to can that deployment. But about a week later, we had an opportunity to deploy it a lot further um, east than we planned but right at the sort of the gateway into the Ross Sea for where the sort of the meltwater and the, the warmer, deeper water is sitting. Uh, and so we got this, this glider to do its thing. And the data that came back showed this, this warmer, deeper water down at maybe sort of four or 500 meters is right at the lip of the continental shelf. And so at the moment, it's everything's okay. This, this warm water um, that's been warmed over you know, processes stretching back a couple of decades, it's not going to take much to push that up over the edge of the continental shelf. And then it'll actually sort of flow in a little bit like um, a creek or, or a river underneath the ice shelf, the biggest ice shelf on the planet, and really enhance melting of that system. And so to me, that was like, oh, wow, the sort of difference between how we are now and some quite big changes is 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 really only a few tens of metres. Huh. If you talk about that time-wise, can you say tens of metres, what is that, a few years, a few decades? Well, I think that's the kind of thing where um, we're researching. I don't think I would, <laughs> would go out in a sort of a public forum really throwing out um, ideas around timescales. But, but I guess the key point is that once it's unleashed, it will take a long time you know, even if you, you suddenly turned around and, and did everyone did their best in terms of emissions, it's much easier to prevent it than to recover from it. Because because once that warm water gets in under the cavity, um, there's really not much to stop it uh, eating away at this very large chunk of ice. And from that chunk of ice uh, will follow changed ecosystems, dramatic changes to things like krill and penguins and seals and whales but also sea level rise. And yeah, you know, it's it's somewhere that would really be great to avoid going. Craig, you know, something like this must be hugely expensive. And I'm just wondering how dependent you are on government support and funding at a time when there are some big cuts going on 
at all levels in New Zealand, and we're being warned that we face, you know, another tough year economically. Does that make things difficult, or is that sort of outside of your area? <laughs> oh, uh, it's very much inside my area. Uh, you know, it's um, this kind of work is very much in the national and the international good. It's, it's something that um, societies and governments uh, need to decide. Um, how much they value it, but um, yes, it's expensive. But it's not it's not really expensive um, in terms of other sort of national uh, activity. I think they've been talking about the national science challenges wrapping up at the at the moment, and they've been order of a little bit more than half a billion dollars. But that's actually over ten years. You know, science budgets get talked about as being large, but New Zealand spends less in in terms of its research than uh, countries that we like to compare ourselves with. Things like you know the OECD average and things like that. How much can you tell me? How much it has cost this expedition? A day on an icebreaker is order of of a hundred thousand dollars, and then you've got the the staff time and the, the people on board. It's certainly not cheap, but the cost of ignorance is far far greater. You know, the cost of of everyone saying, "Well, nothing's going on. It's okay. We'll be fine." You look at the the costs for very very large uh, tropical cyclone events, and they're sourced from somewhere else. So I'm not making the suggestion that that they're coming from Antarctica, but a changed climate, um, the costs from that are, will far exceed the the sorts of money that we're spending on scientific research. But there's sort of a territorial reason that, that New Zealand's working in this area as well. You know, we operate Scott Base and we lay some sort of claims to the Ross dependency. And so you, you can't make those claims and not, not be there. It's not just climate that is supporting why we would be working in these areas. You know, uh, the climate problem and the changes in Antarctica are something that are, that's that's here with us for the future. Um, and you know, I'm nearing the end of my career, and and what's really important is that we give some opportunities to to the next generation coming along. And so so most of my team were what we call early career researchers. So they, most of them had done their PhD. Uh, or was still working on it, um, but finding their way in the science world. And so we had some some philanthropic funding from a philanthropist, um, Max3, as well as our sort of science platform money to, to give these people sort of a, 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 an opportunity of a lifetime to build their science networks and to go to on a really high profile mission. And so, you know, the problem's not going away and we need people to be discovering things for New Zealand. That's it for today. The detail is supported by RNZ and NZ On Air. Alexia Russell and Gwen McClure produced this episode. Jeremy Ansell engineered it. Thanks to Craig Stevens and Liv Cornelison, also to Lana Young for supplying the great sound and visuals from the ship. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly, Arriva Dirtchie.